got to be the most boring lecture I ever give. I mean, therapeutic protein production in eukaryotic cells, it's terrible, isn't it? I've, I've tried to generate a bit more interest by giving holiday tips and um, pictures of furry animals and things like that as we go along. So hopefully it'll be, it'll be OK, but I, I'm always a bit nervous by this lecture. So... Um, and uh, there's also a sign-in sheet going round, so if you could sign that, please, that'd be great. OK, so um, hopefully it won't be too boring. But uh, this is what we're going to cover. So um, I'll introduce you to uh, what recombinant therapeutic proteins are, um, the mammalian cell types that are currently being used to make these um, recombinant um, proteins, um, how they're produced, um, then CHO cell engineering, so CHOs are the um, most widely used um, mammalian cell type for producing these recombinant proteins, so these are Chinese hamster ovary cells. Any, anyone grown CHO cells here? They're pretty common. No one grown them? No, not on placement or anything like that? Okay, um, and then other expression systems, so the insect bacular virus cell system I'll briefly cover. I'll briefly cover yeast and also uh, milk from transgenic goats, and then a little bit at the end on um, some clinical uses of these therapeutic proteins. Okay, so why are they so important then? Well, um, uh, they're very important for industry, so for producing proteins to treat human disease. Come on in. Have you, have you got it submitted? Yes, yes well done. <laughs> Well done, Sophie Langdon, for those of you listening at home. She's got her um, grant submitted. Um, and individual abstracts. Great, great. OK, you can relax now. Um, you've basically graduated. OK, so, um, yeah, so industry um, uh, are very interested in, in producing therapeutic proteins to make lots of money with products to treat human disease. And... Um, there are over 100 uh, recombinant protein therapeutic proteins that have been so far approved by the uh, US Food and Drug Administration. I should probably get this updated. It, it, it's going to be, I should say, substantially more than 100 now. And, and again, uh, this probably needs to be updated as well. But a couple of years ago, when I put this slide together, there were global sales exceeding um, $120 billion in, in therapeutic uh, recombinant proteins. So they're also very uh, important for academia, so people like myself uh, who run labs, we are, are often producing uh, recombinant proteins uh, to help uh, functionally analyse proteins, so if we can produce uh, lots of the protein, uh, we can then do our functional studies, um, and then also for uh, structural determination, so we have a lot of uh, structural biologists in uh, the School of Biosciences and, and they want to produce large amounts of pure protein that they can uh, crystallise to get crystal structures or perhaps use to get more low resolution uh, type structural information from. And then um, quite surprisingly to me when I first put these lectures together a few years ago there's a lot of cutting edge developments going on in um, therapeutic protein production so it's not as dull as it might sound uh, industry in particular are continually doing research into ways of improving uh, the efficiency with which they produce these proteins um, and enabling them to make modifications to the uh, proteins. But the efficiency is quite important because even tiny improvements in, uh, in yield and efficiency can really uh, cut costs and get more profits for the companies. <coughs> So th these uh, were the major classes uh, of biological drugs uh, back in 2011. So you can see our monoclonal antibodies um, occupy about um, uh, uh, 20, that's not 20%, that must be 20 different monoclonal antibodies. What is that 20.3? Um, it's not 20.3%, is it? That'd be a very bizarre pie chart. Um, 
We'll have to look into that anyway. You can look up the paper and figure out exactly what this pie chart means, but the major class of biologics are uh, monoclonal antibodies. You can see in the orange here, we also have hormones that are important, growth factors, uh, various fusion proteins, cytokines, and some other, um, other types of protein like anticoagulants, um, uh, recombinant vaccines, um, therapeutic enzymes. Okay, um, so um, the very first therapeutic proteins, they, they weren't recombinant. We'll come to what recombinant is in a minute. Uh, but these were just proteins that were extracted from human tissue or, or human blood. Uh, and so these were uh, things like uh, clotting factors um, to replace absent clotting factors that uh, are the cause of um, haemophilia, the bleeding disease, and we'll, we'll have a bit of that towards the end. Uh, human serum albumin, so albumin is the most abundant protein in our blood, and so it's uh, used in, um, in fluids that are given intravenously after we lose blood in an accident or something like that, so it's to, to replace uh, blood volume very quickly with fluids, and, and these need um, albumin in, in them to give the right um, osmotic balance. Um, insulin, important for um, diabetes, and then this glucocerebrosidase. So uh, this is an enzyme that's deficient in a disease called Gaucher's disease, and this is where uh, the macrophages become um, very lipid-laden, um, and you get all sorts of uh, problems uh, as a result of that, neurological problems, uh, bleeding problems, problems with pain in the joints. So, but replacement with with um, uh, glucocerebrosidase from a healthy person can um, relieve uh, the disease symptoms. So, I guess this was okay back then. It was all clinicians could really do, but there were some major disadvantages of just getting your therapeutic proteins um, from um, from human tissue or blood. So uh, you couldn't do it on an industrial scale. You know, you couldn't have loads of humans in, uh, you know, in a kind of human farm producing these things. So it's very small scale. Uh, there was great potential for harmful viruses or prions to, to contaminate the people receiving uh, these proteins that, that were taken from other people. And there's no opportunity to do any clever engineering to make uh, improvements uh, of the sort we discussed with antibodies, you know, taking glycosylation off, things like that. You just, you just can't do it. You're, you're stuck with what you've, you've got, really, just using proteins extracted from human tissue. Um, but then along came um, recombinant um, therapeutic proteins. So... Just to make the definition really clear, so recombinant protein is protein that's derived from recombinant DNA. So what's recombinant DNA? Well, recombinant DNA is DNA that's been brought together from two different sources. So recombined from two different sources, uh, typically um, a plasmid vector that you insert uh, your human cDNA sequence into, and then that plasmid vector will produce that protein, um, uh, could be in a bacteria, but we're talking today about uh, eukaryotic cells and particularly mammalian cells. And the very first therapeutic protein to be produced in this way was uh, way back in 1986 by uh, the big company uh, Genentech in, on the west coast of the USA, and this was tissue plasminogen activator. This is uh, a so-called clot buster to treat um, thrombotic stroke. And um, to get a bit of interest, I'll just quickly digress into, into this disease. So um, here we have um, a nice uh, carotid, carotid artery uh, supplying the brain with, with blood. And... Um, Unfortunately, there's this disease called atherosclerosis going on in, um, in our arteries. So this is um, a consequence of our, our kind of Western lifestyle. Uh, 
fatty food, smoking, drinking, too much drinking alcohol, lack of exercise, all those sort of things will contribute to this disease where we get fatty deposits in the lining of our arteries and we get a nasty inflammatory reaction going on uh, in the lining of these vessels uh, such that we get um, progressive narrowing uh, of the vessel with age. Uh, this, this can sometimes uh, rupture and we get um, massive platelet activation that can, can block blood flow. Or another thing that can happen is we get small, uh, small clots break off and travel up um, the artery and become lodged at a certain point uh, in the brain vasculature. Um, and, and both of these uh, occurrences will cause stroke. So this is where we lose blood supply to part of the brain because of one of these um, blockages. And when you lose blood supply to part of the brain for more than about three minutes, that brain tissue will die. And that's unfortunately when we get the characteristic stroke symptoms where we'll uh, possibly lose control of part of our body that's, um, uh, that's controlled by that part of the brain. So stroke often doesn't kill you, but it is a major cause of, of disability. And so this is where our clot busters come in. If you can catch stroke early, within two or three hours, uh, you can um, effectively treat it with this recombinant tissue plasminogen activator or clot buster. And actually, it really is the only treatment we've got at the moment for stroke. We're, we're in urgent need of, of better treatments for this, for this disease. And as I mentioned, you've got to catch it early as well, otherwise it just isn't effective. So here we have our, our blood vessel um, uh, made up by these uh, pinkish um, endothelial cells that line all our blood vessels. Uh, and here we've got um, uh, a clot uh, rich in red blood cells that probably already always, there'd also be some platelets in this clot. And you can see we've got this fibrin, fibrin meshwork, meshwork um, that surrounds the clot and, and the fibrin uh, is the product of the coagulation cascade. So something's gone wrong here to allow this clot to form. Perhaps it's broken off um, um, a larger clot in one of these diseased um, areas. But if we can come in with um, tissue plasminogen activator, uh, what this will do is it will convert inactive plasminogen in the blood, this, um, um, this blue um, hexagon, it'll convert that into active plasmin. And what plasmin does is to break down these fibrin strands um, and dissolve the clot into these uh, FDPs or fibrinopeptides. So it breaks up the fibrin meshwork into fibrin peptides uh, and releasing the red cells and, and uh, releasing the clot. So restoring blood supply to that part of the brain from where it was lost. So tissue plasminogen activator is a, a natural protein produced by uh, the blood vessels. And there's lots of checks and balances naturally in this process. So we have an, an inhibitor uh, of, of this protein. So uh, I think this is plasminogen activator inhibitor. Uh, and then you can see we've also got a plasmin inhibitor. So lots of checks and balances on this very important um, clot breakdown process. Because, of course, breakdown of the clot is a natural occurrence uh, when we have a normal... Your TV's gone off. What's happened, Alice? Yeah, maybe it'll come back. So... Um, so th this is um, a very natural thing in the body when we injure ourselves and we, uh, we have a clot form to stop ourselves losing too much blood. Ultimately, once it's all healed, we want to break that clot down and return things to normal. And that's where the, uh, the, the plasmin and the, the tissue plasminogen activator come in. But obviously, in a stroke scenario, we want to very rapidly break up this clot. And we can do that with, by administering recombinant uh, tissue plasminogen activator or this clot, clot buster to the patient. Okay. Okay, so what, what are the, the mammalian cell types that are currently used then to make these recombinant proteins? So uh, this is just a little graph showing you uh, over different time periods um, the uh, percentage of um, approved products that have been made in mammalian in blue versus non-mammalian uh, systems um, in red. 
And you can see that what's happening is that the mammalian over time is starting to, to dominate. So the, the non-mammalian would include things like uh, bacteria and, um, uh, and insect systems, that sort of thing, uh, um, and yeast systems. So uh, we're definitely starting to see uh, mammalian systems being uh, favoured by uh, biopharmaceuticals, biopharmaceuticals for producing these uh, recombinant therapeutic proteins. And then this is just to show you how our, our Cho cells, our Chinese hamster ovary cells, um, uh, are at the top of the list. Um, so they're the most um, commonly used mammalian expression system, and I'll come to them in a minute. You can see that human cell lines, quite surprisingly, aren't used very much. Um, other mammalian cell lines uh, here, such as mouse, uh, feature much more prominently than human. And then we've got our um, E. coli, which are still used uh, quite a lot for making recombinant proteins uh, therapeutically. And we've got our yeast and then miscellaneous, which would include um, things like um, insects and also goats. We'll come to the, the goats a bit later on. Okay. Yeah, so another... another um, little attempt to make it more interesting. I often wonder, is, is this photoshopped, do you reckon, this, this hamster? He doesn't look like he's quite gripping properly, does he? He's looking very chilled out, he or she. Uh, what do you reckon, photoshopped or a real hamster doing acrobatics? Yeah, what do you reckon? No? You think that's photoshopped? Oh, that, that makes me sad now. But I believe you. So, so anyway, here's... Here's our hamster, and, and this is what Cho cells look like. So these are some Cho cells growing on, on plastic. Um, they're adherent cells, as you can see, and they grow, um, they grow quite nicely, very easy to grow. Um, just a quick digression into uh, bacterial systems. So um, these have already been covered by Dr. Huber, I believe, uh, with you. So he'll have gone over the fact, I guess, that uh, advantages of bacteria such as E. coli are that they're uh, very easy to culture, they grow very rapidly, um, so you can produce vast amounts of, of E. coli in big bioreactors. You can induce expression with the chemical IPTG, so grow up loads and then induce expression. And the protein purification is very simple. You just crack your bacteria open and you'll have loads of, of your protein. There are some disadvantages, though, of bacterial expression systems versus uh, the eukaryotic. So some eukaryotic proteins just don't express very well in bacteria. They don't fold up properly. Um, and some, of, some actually express too well so uh, and they be can become um, insoluble in inclusion bodies sometimes that can be useful because you can purify the inclusion bodies and get large amounts of protein but often you then need to refold the protein uh, because they become partially denatured in the inclusion bodies so it, it can it can complicate matters anyway uh, and also, uh, most post-translational modifications, such as addition of carbohydrate, would not take place uh, in a bacteria. They just don't have the enzymes uh, to add these modifications. So, clearly some advantages of mammalian cell lines. So, here's our, our hamster again. Um, so, really the big advantages of using mammalian cell lines is that you can make proteins that are as similar as possible to those that naturally occur in the human. So if the aim is to therapeutically replace a protein that's been lost from a human patient, you want something as, or you may need something as, as close as possible uh, to the human. So you'd want the, the molecular structure to be, to be just spot on, and also the biochemical properties of, of the protein you're putting in to be as near as possible as close as possible to the, uh, the human protein that may have been lost by uh, genetic mutation, for example, that led to a, a disease. So uh, these four cell lines, uh, CHO, BHK, NS0 and SP2s, uh, are the main ones used by the pharmaceutical industry. So 
I don't know why the hamster just keeps getting all this grief from um, these companies, but they seem to love sales from hamsters. So not just Chinese hamster ovary cells, but baby hamster kidney cells. I mean, this is even worse, isn't it, that you would make the baby hamsters suffer and um, some poor baby hamster had its cells taken at some point to make these cells. Um, and then there are these two mice, m mouse myelomas. So a myeloma um, is a, a cell that, that produces monoclonal antibodies. So that's why these myelomas are so, pos uh, so popular for um, actually... Uh, so these will have been a, a fusion of... Um, yeah, so, so these two cell lines are used to fuse with um, real B cells from a mouse. These have come from a mouse that's been Im immunised to make antibodies. You then take the B cells, fuse them with a, with a myeloma, and you hopefully make an immortalised cell line that's now producing the antibody you want. Okay. So, um, so why is it then that Cho cells are so uh, popular? Uh, I think a, a large part of it is that they've just been used for so long, so it's just so easy. Um, you can very easily get approval, given that so many people previously ha have used them effectively. So they've had 20 years of over 20 years of use in the pharmaceutical um, industry. Uh, and uh, methods have now been developed to increase expression, so to, to amplify um, uh, genes that are introduced uh, in, into the Cho cells. Uh, they also produce uh, glycoforms that are active in humans, so the, um, the hamster glycosylation is very similar to the human glycosylation. And although they're adherent cells, they can be adapted to grow in suspension uh, and also in serum-free conditions. So it's uh, often a good idea to grow your cells in very defined media so you know exactly what, what's going in there. You can, you can reproduce it time and time again, whereas uh, using uh, fetal bovine serum, for example, which, you know, which I would use to grow cells, you're never quite sure what's in there. It's not a defined medium, but, but these cells can be adapted to grow in a particular uh, recipe of serum-free media. And you can grow them in these massive tanks, so up to 10,000 litre bioreactors that are stirred to produce huge amounts of, of protein. And I guess another advantage is that a lot of human pathogens that you might be worried about that could come along with a, a recombinant um, therapeutic protein, uh, they just don't rec replicate in hamster cells. So you, you have less risk of, of transferring, say, a human virus uh, through a recombinant protein. Um, but it seems logical to me that one day human cell lines might overtake Cho's um, so reasons for this could be that um, it is possible to get an immune response to some of these um, uh, hamster or mouse uh, glycoforms. They're not exactly the same as human. Um, so it could be an advantage to use a human cell instead. Um, uh, it could actually be safer in some ways uh, to make it in human uh, and also better for very complex proteins. They might just fold up better in a human cell line than, it, than in a hamster. And so there are some uh, quite widely used cell lines, uh, uh, HEC293, Percy 6 and CAP, CAP T. So, so some of you must have grown HEC293. Who, who's grown HEC293? They're very common. Yeah, I can see a few, few hands going up here. Yeah. So... Um, so you'll know that this is what they look like. So they're um, adherent cells. They're, they're not incredibly adherent. You can quite easily get them off the plastic. Uh, so very commonly used um, in a, a lot of labs, very easy to grow. You know, they tend to double every day and you can um, rapidly grow them up. They're really easy to transfect, so introduce uh, genes um, and you can get very high expression levels. So up to uh, one gram per litre. Um, and there are some, a number of interesting variants developed. So um, you can get the 293N3S, 
uh, that grow in suspension culture. So I have, to have, I have to have a go at Alice here because her boss, you know, her project supervisor, Yi, I said, can I have your suspension cells? And he said, you can, but you've got to come to my lab and do everything because they're under uh, an MTA, right? So, so we've decided now not to use them because it would be too much of a hassle to have to go to your lab to, to do all our experiments. But we think we can, we can get away with common or garden hex cells. But obviously, Alice and Yi up in the medical school are um, more sophisticated and they're using the suspension cells, which have some advantages. You can grow them up denser. Um, do you actually use those, Alice, or are you using the... Oh, yeah, very good, very good. Okay, and you like them? I love them. Yeah, see, endorsements <laughs> from one of the, your fellow students. Okay, uh, and then there's the 293S that um, uh, 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 have been adapted to grow in serum-free media, and then these are the ones that I grow, the uh, simple 293Ts. So these have been transformed with the large T antigen from um, SV40. Um, virus, and so these, uh, this T antigen uh, allows episomal replication of the plasmid, so you can get lots of copies of the plasmid in your hex cells without necessarily having the plasmid to uh, integrate into the genome um, after a transient transfection. And then finally, we've got these HK, HKB11s. This is actually a hybrid between uh, the 293S and a human B cell line, um, and supposedly here you can get even higher transfection efficiency and even higher protein expression. But I've actually never come across these HKB11. Have you grown those, Alice? No, just no. Six. Yeah. Anyone grown those HKB11 on placements or anything like that? No. Do they really exist? I've read it somewhere, but yeah, I've never come across anyone who's used them. And, and also, I've, I've never come across uh, these cells, apart from reading about them in preparing uh, this lecture, but uh, made by the company Crucell, these per C6 cells. Uh, they look a little bit like hex cells. They're an adherent cell line. Uh, apparently very well characterized. They can be adapted uh, to suspension culture like hex and also to grow uh, in serum-free media, and you can get very high levels of expression, apparently, so 0.3 to 0.5 grams per litre. And then finally, another cell line that I've never grown myself or really come across, these uh, uh, CAP or CAP T cells made by uh, the company CVEC, and so these, the CAP stands for CVEC amniocyte production, and the CAP Ts have been transformed with uh, uh, SV40 large T antigen, similar to the way that, that the HEC 293Ts have been uh, transformed. Um, interestingly, these have a, a stem cell origin, and this stem cell origin could be the reason why these cells are particularly good for expressing difficult to express proteins. So it's known that stem cells express a, a wide variety of different proteins. So could it be that they have a better variety of processing enzymes and chaperones that uh, really allow you to uh, successfully produce a very wide variety of different proteins? And the yields are very similar to HEC293 cells. Okay. Right, so now we come on to um, the actual uh, production. Um, so... Um, I hate to keep mentioning Alice, but you know she she could give this lecture, but I'll just you know let you carry on taking notes, and I'll I'll do it. So this is the the simple way we we produce uh, therapeutic proteins in a mammalian cell line. So we uh, engineer the cell line to produce our, our desired protein, and we ensure that our protein has a signal sequence on it, which will target it through the secretory pathway. So it will get produced. Uh, through the endoplasmic reticulum, it'll go via transport vesicles to the Golgi, where it'll have its various sugar modifications and things like that added. Um, and then it will be transported um, in secretory vesicles because of its uh, uh, signal sequence, and it will then be released um, uh, into the supernatant. And so we can then very easily harvest our protein as it gets uh, released uh, out into the, into the supernatant. So we don't have to lyse our cells or anything like that. We can simply 
um, harvest the media, harvest the protein from the media that the cells are grown in. And for some uses, we don't even have to do any purification. We can simply take that supernatant and use that for experiments because it's a rich source of that particular protein. So um, the expression vector the, the, that my lab uses is something called PHL-SEC. Um, it's a, a, a derivative of this PLEX uh, backbone. So the, the PLEX, you'll notice some of the features it has, this uh, orange ampicillin resistance marker. So that allows you to grow the plasmid uh, in bacteria uh, because of the ampicillin resistance. It's got the, uh, the classic origin of replication for, for uh, production in bacteria. And then it's got a, a chicken beta actin promoter to drive expression of the, the cDNA you insert into it. So this is a very strong promoter, this green chicken beta actin promoter. It's got this uh, red uh, uh, poly A signal. And then it's got a multiple cloning site with a, a number of restriction sites that you would use to insert your cDNA of interest. Uh, it's got a, a signal sequence uh, to target it on the secretory pathway. That's inserted uh, just upstream of the multiple cloning site. And then importantly, it also has um, a C-terminal his, his tag, so six um, histidine residues uh, that are used for purification uh, because um, nickel beads can be used to bind the his tag and, and capture uh, the protein of interest. So um, th this is a simple overview of the, of the steps you would go to to, uh, to make your recombinant protein if you were either in a lab or in, in industry. So you would uh, use uh, various molecular biology techniques to generate your plasmid containing your cDNA of interest that you want to express. You would transfect that into um, cells such as uh, Cho cells or HEC293 cells, or if, if you're Alice, you know, you'd have these fancy suspension um, HEC cells. Um, then you... Um, uh, select a particular clone that's uh, secreting very high expression um, and you can then um, go to a, a large scale production. 12 months seems a long time. I think in the lab we can do this pretty quickly, but I guess maybe in industry if you're working in a relaxed manner and you want to really make sure you've got the best possible clone, maybe it takes that long. It does seem rather a long time, 12 months. I think you could do it quicker. But just to go into um, a bit more detail, so uh, you start with your um, expression vector. So this you've, you've generated using molecular biology, you've digested your, your expression vector, you've inserted your cDNA of interest and checked that it's okay, sequenced it. Um, some people then uh, linearize this um, plasmid. I, I tend not to bother, the, the reason linearization is supposed to help is because what you want to happen is for the plasmid to stably integrate into the genome of the cells and so some people say well if you linearize it in a in a region of the plasmid that doesn't matter um, then it's more likely to go in uh, nicely into the genome and give you your antibiotic resistance and your cDNA of interest I'm, I'm not quite sure I'd I buy that. It seems to work just fine for me, just transfecting in the plasmid and allowing it to be randomly cut at some point by um, the cell machinery and then, then integrate. What you'll then do, what you then have is a pool of cells that are transfected. Some won't have been transfected. It, you rarely get 100% transfection. Um, and, but you can throw on your uh, selection marker um, something like a puramycin, so you would have a puramycin resistance cassette in your plasmid of interest, so you can uh, kill off all the non-transfected cells or, or cells where you just haven't got integration of this, uh, this DNA into the genome, so you get, you get rid of all the ones that um, don't have the plasmid, and then you can expand the surviving cells, which in theory are all expressing your cDNA of interest. Not all of them will, but, but you hope most of them will. And what you then do is to select um, 
uh, or to make single cell clones. So you would plate out these, this pool of cells uh, across a 96 well plate or more typically several 96 well plates. And as the, then the clones will grow up, maybe that will take three or four weeks. Uh, you can then pick the clones and screen them to see which clones are producing the highest level of, of the protein you want. Um, and then you can um, um, eventually end up with a kind of master cell bank where you have uh, the highest expressing clones uh, frozen down and then you can um, get them out whenever you want to and they will produce large amounts of the protein. So um, an alternative to doing uh, this quite laborious process of making stable clones is to just do a transient transfection. And uh, a transfection reagent such as PEI, polyethylenamine, uh, is, is quite commonly used. It's this, uh, uh, this 25 kilodalton linear form is, is the most commonly used. Um, and a great advantage of this is you can do things quickly. So uh, you don't have to select stable cells. You can simply transfect a large number of cells Two days later, you could harvest the supernatant and, and you've got lots of the, the protein of interest. And it's very inexpensive. So I, I once did a little um, cost calculation. We used to use uh, something, what was it called? Um, I forget what it was called, but a commercial uh, reagent similar to this that we'd kind of found worked well and was the cheapest we could get. And I did this little calculation and I worked out that each transfection I was doing cost me 67 pence, you know, which doesn't, doesn't sound too bad, does it? But I guess if you do a lot of them, it starts to add up. And then I heard about this PEI, which you just buy from Sigma in a big bottle and, and you get kind of a lifetime supply. Um, and I worked out the cost. So if you remember, the, the cheapest commercial source, 67 pence a transfection. With PEI, I worked out you could do 4,000 transfections for one pence. So it's quite, quite a saving. So I now really recommend this PEI to, to anybody doing these transfections. It, it actually works really well. Um, Alice, I bet you use this, don't you? Yeah, of course, Alice uses it. Alice is our resident expert for the day. OK, so... Um, Yes, yeah, so it, it, it's inexpensive, um, becoming quite widely used now. Um, and um, I guess a disadvantage, though, is, is that if you're going to do this on a large scale, you need a lot of plasmid DNA. So the cost starts to creep in in terms of what it costs to do plasmid preps, because um, plasmid prep columns and things like that um, do have a cost and it, it does add up when you, when you start to make large amounts of DNA. And also you need to have grown up a large amount of cells to actually do this. Uh, An expression will only, uh, I mean, 10 to 14 days seems a bit optimistic. We tend to harvest after two or three days. Um, so you, you, you eventually lose expression, unlike the stable cell lines that I talked about earlier, where you have expression um, forever. Okay, and so this is the way PEI works. So uh, PEI is this positively charged uh, uh, lipid uh, polymeric molecule. DNA is negatively charged, so when you mix them together in a tube, they will stick together, and it really is as simple as that. You just kind of put your DNA with your PEI, wait 10 minutes for them to stick to each other, and then you just add it to your cells. And because it's a lipid, it will... Uh, magically get taken up across the plasma membrane and then because of the properties of the PEI uh, uh, once it gets to a certain pH in these um, um, endocytic vesicles it will somehow cause the DNA to burst out into the, the cytoplasm where it can then go on and give you expression and integrate um, into the genome potentially without actually getting degraded by, by it within these vesicles. Right, I think I'm, I reckon we've probably got another half an hour to go, but I think we'll have a five minute break here um, and then come back. Does that sound good? So if we come on that clock, let's go for 10 to, and then um, otherwise I think we'll probably end up with a rather long 
hour and a half session or something like that. Okay.